I feel awkward not having shoes on. <laughs> for me. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, come on by and join us at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today we will be in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. So let's go ahead and grab our Bibles, a cup of coffee if you're at home relaxing or in Dallas. Say, hey, Carlos, glad you joined us if you're still in Dallas there. Um, and we will get started. Let's, let's pray. Gracious Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity where we can gather together in unity and one accord, Father, and the same, and worship the same God, Father, that you have revealed to us through your word, Lord. Lord, that we can have a hunger and a thirst for your word, Lord, so that we can draw closer to you, Father. Our heart's desire, Father, is to know you, to understand you, and Lord, to know that the instructions that you have given us in your word, Lord, are for our benefit, for our good, for our well-being, Lord. And so, Lord, we thank you for that opportunity to open up your word this morning as we begin our day afresh and anew this day. Thank you for getting us through the week. We pray you prepare the weekend. Prepare our hearts, Lord, for the message on Sunday, Lord. Wherever we're uh, worshiping at, in whatever temple, in whatever city, Lord. We had a brother uh, Wednesday join us from Florida. So, Lord, wherever we're at, I pray, Lord, that you would just minister to us on Sunday through your word and, and the word that we're going through with our pastor and those that are teaching us, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, again, let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Good morning, Emily. Glad you could join us. We're in the book of Ephesians, and we're in chapter 4. Uh, just to give you a, a reminder of what's going on here in this little book, this is Paul's second missionary journey. He left Aquila and Priscilla there in the Ephesian church uh, to minister, and he's writing to them to bring a word of encouragement. And obviously in chapters uh, 1, 2, and 3 has been nothing but what Christ has, has done for us. I mean, it's just amazing when we, we look at uh, what Jesus has done for us through, through his death and, and burial and resurrection. He has given us adoption, redemption, inheritance, power, life, grace, citizenship, and it's all done through the love of Jesus Christ. So 1, 2, and 3 is a summary of everything that God has done for us. And then now Paul's going to go to the sanctification part of our life and now what we should do as believers in Christ Jesus. Uh, they're living in a time in a world where the Greek there in Greece, in Athens, Ephesians, uh, they worshiped idols. They worshiped uh, the goddess Diana. They worshiped sexuality. And so for this is what they served, literally served. The word served there means to give everything, whether, whether it's um, uh, giving of yourself, of your material things, of giving of your life, even of your tilling. Everything was, was surrounded of how you served and worshiped your idol, your God. So like we are told by Jesus himself, we're to worship God with what? All our might, soul, mind, and strength, right? So they did. They worshiped their gods with everything that they had. Even in their tilling and, and their planting and their, their vineyards and so forth were done in prayer to their gods, that there would be prosperity so that they could give to their gods. It's kind of like us today in the world that we live in. Uh, they may not know this, but the God that they have created in their lives, that's the God that they worship. And they worship that God with everything that they have. Everything that they do, everything that they think is all about that philosophy, that um, doctrine uh, and belief system. That They pour everything into it. Now, you may not understand that fully, but I think if we were to really look at our lives as Christians, we would find out what we really worship. We'd find out what we really worship. What is your daily habits like? <clears throat> do you read in the morning? Do you pray to God in the morning? Do you seek fellowship? Then that gives you uh, an idea of what you're truly worshiping. You're worshiping God. Or if you don't pray, who, you, who are you then depending on for that day? Is it yourself? Ah, then maybe you worship yourself more than you worship God. Because you're putting your faith in yourself that you're going to handle the day correctly. You're, you're going to handle the challenges 
you know, when they come at you, instead of saying, Lord, you handle those challenges. You lead me and guide me. So if you're not praying to God, who are you praying to? Well, you're depending on yourself. So you'll find that your whole life is surrounded by the fact that that's who you depend upon is yourself. And you created a God. <coughs> and usually what we do is we create a God that's after ourselves, right? I remember Pastor Chuck Smith talked about some pygmies in, in, in uh, a forest area and how he had uh, read that these pygmies had created a little god, a, a, a little idol, and he noticed that this little idol had a shorter leg than the other. And, and he realized that what they did was they created that god after their own image because a lot of them had this deformity of a shorter leg than the other, and they walked with a little bit of a limp. So that's the god they created. And oftentimes they would create their gods with their flaws because they made themselves out to be god. And wasn't that the original sin of Eve, right? When Satan came to her and said, you know, uh, God is keeping you from a secret. And that is that you'll become God if you partake of this fruit. And, and that just caused her to think, you know, wow, I want to be God. I want to be in control of my life. I want to make my directions and my paths and my decisions on my own and not let God do so. And that's the sin nature that's in us is to do that instead of depending on God completely and letting God make those decisions for us. We don't like that. It's foreign to us because now we're depending on someone else to make those decisions. But that is exactly what God wants from us. That's called sanctification, where we surrender our life uh, to Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and look at chapter four and see what Paul is asking us now to do. So he says in verse one, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness, gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, enduring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Wow, there's a lot right there, isn't there? He, as a prisoner, in other words, I'm a prisoner of my own choice of Jesus Christ. I have submitted myself and my will to the Lord and no one else. I will be led by God and God alone because I'm shackled to him, is what he's saying. And I'm asking you to do the same thing. And then he gives us some words here that we probably need to take time and, and define, but we don't have that time. But he's calling us to walk in this manner. And he, he lays it out very clearly. Walk in lowliness. Lowliness. In other words, in humility. You know, don't go around boasting. Don't go around thinking you're better than others. Don't go around thinking that you know it all because we don't know it all. You know, I told Justin uh, yesterday when I saw him, I said, Justin, I am the dandruff on a hair, on a wart, on the back end of a hog. You know, that's what I am. And he just like, oh, he just started laughing. You know, his voice just started laughing, you know, because usually he says he's the hair on the, on the ward of the back end of the hog. And I go, I go, Justin, I'm the dandruff on that hair. That's how bad I am. You know, that's, that's, and, and you can have a prideful humility. You don't want to have that. And I know I was kind of joking with him, but we have to have that perspective about ourselves. Otherwise we begin to lift ourselves up above others, and that just shouldn't be the case. So walk in loneliness, gentleness. Uh, we know what that means. Be a gentle person. Uh, there's a religions, didn't it? Because he didn't mention Buddha, Muhammad. He didn't mention all those Eastern mysticism, uh, spirituality uh, beliefs. He didn't mention some of the cultic groups of Mormonism. And he's saying, no, there's only one, one true body of Christ. It's not Calvary Chapel. It's not Baptist, it's not Lutheran, it's not Methodist. No, there's just one body. Amen. That's Jesus Christ and, and the body of the church itself. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Well, where did he go? This was Abraham's bosom. In the Old Testament, when a saint died, they went to Abraham's bosom. Not, not literally Abraham's bosom, but it was the place where Abraham was. It was a holding place. It was an area, some suggest maybe the center of the earth. We don't know. It could be the center of the earth. There's maybe a great gulf between that and, and, and um, what the Old Testament says is uh, Gehenna or Hal, uh, Sheol, 
a place where they went in torment to a certain degree and there was separated by a gulf and so Abraham's bosom was on this side and the other side was where the non-believer went to uh, whether it's the center of the earth or not Christ went down there he descended when he was on the cross and he died he first descended went down there preached to the captives that were there in Abraham's bosom to let them know the promise that the father gave to Abraham has been fulfilled I am it Believe in me, and I'll send you to paradise with me. And so he set the captives free there, and now they're all in heaven with him in spiritual form as their bodies are still waiting in the earth to be uh, raptured up at that uh, trumpet call. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So he who ascended, verse 10, is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might <clears throat> fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some, pa some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. <clears throat> so now he talks about the gifts that he has given to the church so that they begin to walk in those things. Uh, so he lists them here very clearly that there's prophets in the church. These are men of God that prophesy according to the word of God. And then he gave some to be evangelists, men that have the gift to share the gospel, to preach the word, to share with, one, uh, with people one-on-one -on -one or in groups or in multitudes. Uh, but they're gifted in that sense. And then he gave some to be pastors and teachers. Uh, pastors in that they pastor the flock. They love the flock. They're compassionate. They're gentle with the flock. They're not quickly to dismiss the flock, to judge the flock, or, or to excuse the flock from church because they have a heart for pastoring people. But they're also teachers. They love teaching uh, the Word of God. And by the way, you can keep me in prayer. I was just asked yesterday... Uh, if I would be kind enough to go to South Sudan <clears throat> in October <clears throat> and teach the chaplains there how to study the Bible mm. inductively. And I was like honored uh, by far-reaching ministries that they would even ask me uh, as now the borders have been opened up and I'll be one of the first to go down there. And they would like me to teach an inductive Bible study that that would spring them into a study from Genesis to Revelation for the rest of the, the year that's coming up. <clears throat> and so I'm honored by that. And I need prayer because I, I need to know that the Lord is leading me that way. I've already, I've already um, <clears throat> contacted some people that support me in my missions and already have raised half of the money uh, to go almost immediately. Cool. So, so it looks like I, I probably more than likely am going to go. I have to let them know, but I just need prayer that God would work all those little details out. Uh, that's my heart. I, I love teaching, and in this sense, I'm going to teach them how to study their Bible so that they can teach and minister to others. That's a teacher, and I'm going to be doing that, and that's a gift. So he says in verse 12 why he has given these things to us. And by the way, you're the church, and these men are raised up to help you. Not to hurt you, though sometimes you might get hurt by them by what they say because they're being honest and they're being truthful and the word of God offends. Uh, that's what's so unique about Calvary Chapel. Uh, they're not gonna water down the word of God. They're gonna tell you what the word of God says. And you have to be willing to say, hey, this is a man of God and they're teachers of God and they're giving me the word of God and I should be able to receive that word. And then it's up to you whether you do it or not. That's between you and God. It doesn't mean we're gonna love you less you know, you'll just have to go through some things <laughs> before, before you learn your lesson, and then you'll learn your lesson, and you'll probably be obedient to the Word because you'll realize that's the way I ought to live my life. And so you'll be offended, but really, they're there to help you. Look at verse 12. For the equipping, they're there for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to what? The unity of faith. That's the goal. God wants us in unity. He wants us all to grow together, not to fight against each other, not to have complaints and murmur and all this stuff, not even in our hearts. Not to leave because you're frustrated like a two-year-old and I'm getting out of here, you know, <laughs> but, but to become in unity, in unity with one another. That's the goal. And he's working on that. Now, has that happened? No, it hasn't happened yet. It's a work in progress. It's punctilar, right? It, it, it's constant that God is working and bringing things up in our lives and in our relationships so that we can continue to grow and grow in that unity of the faith in Jesus Christ. So, and the knowledge of the Son of God 
to the perfect man, to the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunningness, craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. And there are religious groups out there that will tell you what you want to hear. They will tickle your ears until they tickle you to death and right to the pit of hell. And so the word of God is the important thing. What is our grid of truth? The word of God. That is our grid of truth. I am not the grid of truth. Uh, pastors are not the grid of truth. Pastors ought to be teaching the word of God simply. Amen. Not reading a verse and then telling all kinds of wonderful, beautiful stories that move you emotionally, but teaching you what the word of God says interpreting the word of God and then giving you application to the word of God. And that's how you're going to truly grow, truly grow. You know, there's a teaching. Uh, you'll hear sometimes some pastors, not all, but some pastors will, will get up there and, and they'll say, we're to love one another. That's what God says. Love one another. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. And then he'll go off and say, we need to learn to love ourselves. We really do. And he'll go off and talk about how we can't love others without loving ourselves. Is that true? Is that a true doctrine? Is that a biblical truth? No, it's not. That, that's a doctrine from the pit of hell. That's exactly what Satan would tell you. Love yourself. Man, I already love myself. I nourish myself. I comb my hair. I put makeup on. I clothe myself. I feed myself. You know, <clears throat> I saw this at the airport when we were gone. <laughs> it was hilarious. Uh, a mother child, <clears throat> they went and got food as my mom and I were eating and we were in Phoenix, Arizona. And they sat down to eat and she brought her some chips and uh, a cookie. And he sat there and he looked at her like, you know, he, like, he was like, I don't want to eat and I don't want that. You know, and she goes, you know, they were kind of talking to each other, like pointing without talking because there was a lot of people around. And he just kind of like looking like that. And then all of a sudden he, you could see he didn't want to eat it, but he was hungry. So it took about 30 seconds and all of a sudden he grabs the chips and he opens them up. And he just looks at them. And then he reaches in and he grabs one and he eats one. Then he grabs another one. And now he's, now he's let go of the whatever they were upset about. Let's go. Now he's eating. Well, she reaches over and grabs a chip and he goes, he just looks at her like, those are mine, not yours. I could read his mind. It was like, like those are mine. What are you doing touching my chips? You know, I know you bought them. I know you brought them to me, but they're mine and I'm hungry and I'm going to eat them all. And yet you just take one of my. I could see that. We think of ourselves first. Do we love ourselves? Yes, we already love ourselves. See, we ought to teach what Ephesians, and we'll see that in a moment here, that we already love ourselves. That's the problem. <clears throat> we need to love, learn to love others before we love ourselves. Uh, that's embedded in us. Uh, the school teaches us that, right? That we need to love ourselves. So how do you get that out of somebody? You got to let the Lord uh, do that. You got to let the Lord work in people's hearts and continue to be the example of loving them, loving them, loving them, even though they're taker, taker, takers. Because there's takers and then there's givers. And we ought to be givers and not takers. The takers will always take, 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 take. But we as Christians realize that we have a far greater calling to set an example of being giver, givers, givers. And so when you're waiting in line and someone says, I want that, then give it to them because that's what a giver does. Or are you one that says, I'll take it from you because that's what a taker does. Which one will be rewarded? The giver, not the taker. You see, your reward is that you took it and your reward is that you got it. And, but it's temporal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a temporal thing. You got what you wanted, and you enjoyed it, but that's it. You get nothing more. But if you're a giver, that's eternal, because God's going to reward you greatly in heaven. And that's what we ought to be storing up for, is heaven gifts by being givers. <clears throat> so, he goes on and says, we're not, as verse 14 says, not tossed to and fro like children, but, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things unto him who is the head Christ from whom the whole body joint and knitted together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And so when the body of Christ works like that, it grows automatically. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the fertility of their mind. Starts there first, right? Mm -hmm. 
Your walk starts with your mind. What is your mindset? What does your God look like? Because if your God is a God of, that takes, 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 then that's how you're going to live. But if your God is a God of give, 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 like Jesus, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to be a ransom, then you will live that way. It starts in the mind. Then have your understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanliness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. That's the old man. <clears throat> We're to put on Christ. We're not to live like that, be takers and takers and taking and taking, but giving. That's how the world lives, right? That's yes. the world. Take, take, take. And if you can steal, 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 and greed, 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 then do it. Good for you. Lie, lie, lie. Cheat, cheat, cheat. That's the world. Not us. That's the former things. So he says, put on the new man, verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It's because it starts there. Let your spirit be renewed in Christ. Be like Christ. How can I be like Christ? How can I love Christ? How can I form my life after his life. Let me read about him. Let me study his patterns. Let me study his mind, his intent, his very heart. And you see it in the gospels, don't you? And Lord, help me through prayer, Lord. Help me to be like him. And that you may put on the new man, which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, lying, put it away. Each one speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give peace or give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. Isn't that interesting? Take care of yourself. Work hard. And when you're working hard, you'll also get an opportunity to help someone else. You'll be a giver. That's what he wants. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Ooh, we were just talking about that, brother. Right? Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. That's the kind of communication we ought to have that imparts you know, um, encouragement, imparts strength, imparts grace, imparts love. But sometimes we communicate with each other and it doesn't impart that. Uh, we make each other look silly or funny or, or and others get upset and so forth. So be careful about how you communicate with one another, what comes out of your mouth. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, calamity, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, so do that with all malice. In other words, he says, whatever it takes, get rid of that garbage and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as Christ also forgave you, so you forgive them. Wow. First chapter is filled with like a grenade full of stuff that we ought to be doing as believers, right? And so that challenge is, is reading that again and saying, Lord, somehow can you help me to apply those things, Lord? I mean, we really ought to just take that back and maybe take a moment today sometime and just read that again and say, Lord, how can you make my heart change so that I can be like that person? How can you do that, Lord? I need your Holy Spirit and your power to do so. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your precious word and the challenge, Lord, and the challenge is there. And we as pure, simple, mortal beings, Lord, don't have the capability of changing our lives, putting on that new man, Lord. We need the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And Lord, at this moment, we ask in the name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit would indwell us and fill us and come upon us and around us, Lord, completely, that we may reflect the very character and nature of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And if he forgave, we ought to forgive too, Lord. Help us, Lord God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. If you have a prayer request, please post it or private message me. We're going to take some time here and we're going to pray with these beautiful people here. There's quite a few people here in the church. Uh, 
we'll lift them up and the Lord will bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. If you don't have a church, uh, consider us. Uh, we're a small church, but we have big hearts as we reach this community here in Harupa Valley. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend.